This morning, as we begin, I want to read the portion of Scripture from Matthew's Gospel. We'll consider it a little later on. Uh, but in Matthew's Gospel, he reaccounts uh, the events of Easter morning. And we read in his Gospel, chapter 28, Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And for the fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. As he promised, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading from his word. Today we rejoice in those words, He has risen. John chapter 19. It is the fourth gospel account, and John takes a very different approach, uh, very much writing it from his own viewpoint, um, and looking at the significance of Christ as the Savior of the world. Uh, We pick up in verse um, 16, yes, it's the end of 16 in to the rest of the chapter. So John chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. Let us hear God's word this morning. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carried, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had, not- not- had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claims to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them among them into four shares, one for each of them. With the undergarment remaining, this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let us not tear it, they said to one another. Let us decide by lots who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So, this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross stood Jesus' own mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing by, nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From this time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then jumping down to verse 38, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. 
He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a tomb in which no one had been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading from his word today. I wonder, have you ever heard of a TV program? It was called um, Extreme Makeovers Home Edition. Now, it's a program, that, it was an American program put together. It ran sort of the early 2000s to about 2012. And the basic premise of the show was that there was a family who lived in terrible conditions and couldn't afford to get themselves out of the situation. And usually they were a, a local hero, someone that had done wonderful things for the community at the detriment of their own house. Or it was someone who had a terminal illness. But what tended to happen in the show was that a team of builders and designers came in. The builders would have been numbering in their hundreds. And they would have taken into the house, knocked it down in a week, and rebuilt it within the same week. Now, I know in Northern Ireland that's not possible, because uh, we use brick, not um, like the Americans who seem to build their houses and knock them down as quick as possible. But the family were always blown away by the before and after transformation. This is an example of one of the houses. As you can see, the house on the top doesn't really look overly livable. The house below definitely looks very low. And the family were always amazed by this transformation. And it was a special show to watch. But you may be wondering, well, what has that got to do with our Easter story? Well, as I sat down in the study to prepare for today, I realised that the Easter story is in and of itself an extreme makeover. There is a whole diff- a world of difference between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, when Christ rose three days later. But I wonder, have you ever thought about what the difference is? What difference does it actually make? And even closer to our hearts, what difference should it make to us? Today, that's what I want us to look at, is what is the difference? Stripping back everything to do with the cross and the resurrection, and asking two questions of two very key statements. The two key statements are, it is finished and he has risen. The two questions that I want us to look at, what difference does it make that Christ has died on the cross for our sins and has risen from the dead? And what difference should it make to us now? The first one we're going to look at is, what difference does it make? And we'll look at the first statement that Christ says on the cross, the last statement Christ says on the cross. It is finished. What do we mean, or what difference does it make when Christ cries out those words, it is finished? Just under a century ago, um, the 11th of November 1918, at 5am in the morning, in a railway carriage in the Companion Forest in Picardy, France. I did have to learn all those words. Paul von Hindenburg, acting German commander, and Ferdinand Foch, the Allied Supreme Commander signed the armistice that brought to an end the First World War. And the papers that morning ran these headlines. It was known as the war to end all wars. There had been such great loss of life in the pursuit of freedom and peace. But sadly we all know how history has played out. Ten years later, Hitler was back on the rise, or Hitler was on the rise, and Germany was growing in power. By 1939, the peace and freedom that had been created was gone. And there was another war. And there have been countless wars ever since. And yet in 1918, it was said this was the war to end all wars. And when we look at the words of Christ on the cross, how do we link these two together? Well, unlike 
what happened since 1918, where war still rages on. When Christ cried on the cross, it is finished. The war that had raged on since the beginning of time was now well and truly over. The war that had raged since Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden, the war between good and evil, the war between God and Satan finished that day on the cross. In Christ, we see a man who gave himself in our place. God himself took upon him all of our punishment for rebelling against God. He bore it all and when he cried, it is finished, that meant that God's judgment and wrath were satisfied. We looked at that on Friday night. Our sin was once and all paid for him. Meaning that we who were once enemies of God are now welcomed into God's family as children of the living God. What a wonderful reality that is. That the war is over. The war that we could never win. There was not a hope that we could ever win. Because of our sin. is now over. And actually we're not on the losing side. We're on the winning side. Because of Christ taking our place. That day on the cross. Christ. God's only son. Finished everything on our behalf. And as he hung on the cross. And cried those words. It is finished. There was nothing more for us to add. Only to trust. That is why. We rejoice in the fact that the cross is empty. Christ is not having to hang there every single day. It is once and for all. It is finished. The war is truly over. And we are truly free. But how do we know it is definitely finished? On Good Friday. All those who stood around saw. Was a man hanging on a cross. Some odd events happening. And him being put in a tomb. How are we to be sure that actually what Christ has accomplished on Good Friday is true and sure? Well, it is because of what we celebrate this morning and that wonderful phrase that the angel gives, He has risen. Three days had passed since Christ's death on the cross. And now the Sabbath had gone and, been, and, and passed. And the women went to the tomb on the first morning of the week. They went to prepare the body for burial. And I'm sure there were many questions going through their head. How are we going to move the stone? Will the guards help us? Will they actually let us in? Are we going to be able to face the body of our rabbi? The one whom we have served and been with for years. And I'm sure they did not expect what they encountered. As they arrived at the tomb, there were no guards. Actually, we're told in Matthew's Gospel, they were like dead men. The stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. And there, sitting on top of the stone, was an angel. And he spoke those three amazing words. He has risen. Words that inspire hope. Words that bring joy. Jesus had risen from the dead. He had defeated the final enemy that stood in our way. Death itself. And what difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. There is no greater difference that has ever been made. From going from being dead to being alive. And when Christ rose from the dead. He defeated death. And he brought eternal life with him. In that moment, hope is born. For those who trust in his death and resurrection, death is no longer the end. Death is the beginning of a life spent with him in paradise. With Jesus rising from the dead, it means that life can begin again. And no matter what we have done, no matter who we are, no matter what background we come from, all can come before the cross and the empty tomb. And trust in him. 
And through his rising, he shows us that he has power to take the punishment for our sins and to forgive us. And he has the power to give us eternal life and give us all the life we need in all its fullness. What an amazing reality that is. What a difference that makes. And no matter who we are, no matter what you have done, when we trust in what happens at the first Easter, we can be forgiven and welcomed into God's family for all eternity. The war is most definitely over. The final frontier of death has been defeated by our only Saviour. The debt is paid for our sin. When we are free, when we trust in Him and seek His forgiveness, to experience a life like no other, a life with no end, and a relationship with God as He intended. That is what difference the death and resurrection of Christ makes. There is no denying that it is historical fact. It makes all the difference in the world. But it is all good and well sticking our hand up and proclaiming that and shouting it from the rooftops. But it should make a difference in us as well. And it begs that question, what difference should it make now? What difference should it make? <coughs> the truth about what happened the difference it made will never change. It is in history. It is unchangeable. But it should cause a reaction in us. A desire to trust. To be different. To share the great news of Christ's sacrifice. But what does it actually look like when we live in the light of the resurrection? What difference should it make in our lives? Well, in life we all have different passions. There are many things that people are passionate about. For me, I am a big sports fan. I love rugby more than I can ever express. I'm a big fan of MotoGP, which is motorbikes. And I'm a massive fan of ice hockey. <coughs> so of those three sports. <coughs> now why I mention my passions? Well, I want to show you a group of people who show what it is to be passionate. Because the reality is if we want to grasp the difference that the cross and the resurrection of Christ should make, we must first have see the passion that is to come with it and the joy that we should have. Because it will drive the difference in us. One of the group of supporters, uh, they're known in Calgary as the Sea of Red. Hopefully you can see them on the screen. The team is called the Calgary Flames. Uh, they hail from the, sort of the west side of Canada. But their fans are nicknamed the Sea of Red. And the reason for this is because the team wear a red jersey. And when it comes to every home game, particularly towards the end of the season when they're in the playoffs, which they were in last night, a 20,000-seater stadium is packed full of red jerseys. There is no other color in that building. And it is an, an almighty thing to behold. I was there in 2004 and got the experience at first hand. And there is, I have never seen passion like it. And the fans wore this red jersey throughout the whole of the season. Actually you'll find people walking up and down the streets during the playoffs with the red jersey. And they'll create what they call the red miles from Calgary. Such is their passion to want to proclaim that they are part of the sea of red. And it's especially beautiful for one reason. Because it's a family affair. When you go to one of those games, there are all ages present. And all are passionate about supporting from the littlest to the oldest. You see the same sort of thing when it comes to Ravenhill on a Friday night. When people are watching Ulster. There is a massive passion. And it spans through the ages. You will see up to three or four generations of a family there shouting at the top of their lungs because they are passionate about the team that they support. But I wonder, is that us here in the church? Are we actually passionate about Christ and his message? 
His wonderful message of grace and salvation. Are we as passionate about it as we are about our other passions in life? Today, today we proclaim something that changed the course of history for everyone. And it's something that will be remembered for all eternity. For those of you who are Ulster fans, they know that we all know that Ulster lost last night. In a year's time, no one will be able to tell you the score, and I very much doubt they will tell you who the players were on the pitch. Yet for over 2,000 years, Christ has been proclaimed as risen from the dead. And it has seen countless people give their all for him because he gave their all, he gave his all for us. But I wonder, are we passionate about it? There is no greater news in this world. They will never hear anything quite like this. But does it cause us to want to shout with joy? So often we can let it pass us by. We don't celebrate with joy the resurrection or share it with others. We'd rather keep it hidden away. As believers, we are called to be passionate about our God, about what He has done in Jesus Christ. I don't stand here for the good of my health. Week in, week out, proclaim it. I proclaim it because it is to be the center of our lives. Christ centered people, dedicated to Him, proclaiming Him to everyone. Is that us? I always go back to that story in my head. It comes up again and again. With D.L. Moody looking out the window. And when he was asked what he saw. Such was his passion for Christ and his gospel. That he proclaims I see countless people. Who without Christ go to hell. So he preached. Every single day as much as he possibly could. Now I realise we're not all outgoing people. But there are ways in which we can show Christ's difference in our lives in practical ways. And in our passage today, we are given two examples of how we can practically show the love of Christ passionately. And the first area that we look at is that of our relationships. If you look back in the passage uh, at verses 25 through 27... We read of an interaction between Jesus on the cross, his mother, and the disciple whom he loved, John. And here Jesus asks John to look after his mother, and vice versa. Even in his dying moments, Christ is still caring and looking out for those that he loves. And look at John's reaction from that very time on this disciple took her into his home John showed this woman the care and love of Christ even though he wasn't, she wasn't his own mother he loved her and he cared for her and today this is what our world desperately needs it needs a church showing the love of Christ for all his people to share his love within our church family. To care for one another and those around us. So that people will see in the community something different. The world has lost its sense of community and caring. Any community that is now created is created for selfish means. And now is the time for the church to develop and grow and nurture. A community of love and grace. Showing Christ's love in a practical way for his world. And the question we've got to ask is, do we love one another? Are we passionate about caring for one another? And I wonder, and it's challenging to me as well, do you know the person that sits on the opposite side of the church from you? More than just a hello at the door on the way out. Or do you know the person that sits upstairs or downstairs? We are called to be a community, called to be a family, 
A family is supposed to see each other more than once a week and care for one another and look out for one another. And it needs to be intentional. We need to take the time to do it. So often the church is seen as a place where we're only asking for your money and your attendance every week. Actually what we value more is your time and fellowship with one another. Building a church community that makes a difference in this world. And I want to encourage you today on all days, of all days, at Easter time. Even if the roast is starting to burn in the oven. Take the time to say hello to somebody that you don't actually know. Or that you haven't seen in a few weeks. Chat to them. See how they are. Don't just flood out the doors at the end of the service. I'll stand there all day. If it takes all day to get you all out. But actually, let us be a community. Take time to say hello to your neighbour. Or someone on the opposite floor from you. Because the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to represent him. To represent his love. Jesus had a real passion for us. And today we should see that passion result in us having the same passion for his people. And those in our community. We have many passions in our lives. But we need to have the same passions as Christ did for others. And then secondly, we are called to stand firm. Or stand up for our faith. In verses 38 to 42, we meet two people. One we meet earlier on in John's Gospel, the man named Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. The other man is a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Both of these men are Pharisees. And they are part of the Sanhedrin, the council that condemned Jesus to die. But they had come to a private faith in Christ. But they would kept it hidden away. Yet on the day of his death, these two men stood up and were counted. They said, yes, I am very much a disciple of Christ. And now I want to bury him with respect. And in this there is a challenge. Are we standing up for Christ. Even though it may cost us a comfort or two. We live in a society that is becoming more and more secular. And the church is becoming more and more disengaged. Because we are not comfortable with standing up. It doesn't mean we stand in the street corner and shout no to everything. But it means that we stand up and point people to the truth of Christ. Showing them the love that he showed us. And the scary reality is, as we sit here and we do not stand up out in society, our country slips further and further away from God. And actually one thing I was told recently at a conference to do with um, preaching to Muslims and converting Muslims. Was it if Christians don't start to stand up, this country won't become more secular. In my lifetime, and I'm already 30, this will be a Muslim country. And what you see on the news of the church being persecuted in the Middle East will arrive on our doorstep. We won't have a leg to stand on. It will not be a case of in our country that it will be green and orange anymore. It will be us fighting for our faith. To point people in the right direction. Remember those words of C.R. D.L. Moody. Those without Christ go to hell. Would you condemn anybody to that torment? At present we are called to stand firm. To be believers who hold out the word of truth. It's a children's hymn that we sang this morning. Shine from the inside out. <clears throat> Comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. To shine for Christ. Pointing people to him. We have to be the difference in our community. 
We cannot be afraid and hide behind our own doors or run our own little clubs and just hope that our friends come along. The church was never called to sit and wait for people to come. There are countless missions run in this country where it is Christians just feeling good for themselves. There's not one unbeliever in that mission hall or at that mission. The church is called to go and to proclaim the truth of Christ. That means going into where we work. And while you may not be able to proclaim Christ with your lips, you can show him in how you act. We can go into our community, into our organizations, and proclaim Christ through how we live and what we say. John later tells us of Christ's calling in John 20 and 21. He says, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father sent me. Remember where Christ came from. He came from God's right hand to earth. I am sending you. And in Matthew's gospel he says, I will be with you to the end of the age. We do not walk this life alone. But we're still called to go. To step out in faith passionately declaring the truth of what happened 2,000 years ago. In that first Easter week. Are we willing to go? When I played rugby back uh, at the age of 17, 18, um, our coach, who was a lovely Christian man, had a motto that we had emblazoned above the changing room door on the way out. And it was a motto that he not, not only gave us for rugby, but one that we were to live our life if we were living for Christ. And it's one that I have sought to live by still to this day. The motto was, no reserve, no retreat, no regret. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. We have only got three score and ten years here on this earth, if we're lucky. Before we spend eternity in paradise with God after trusting in Christ's death and resurrection, what is a little pain or discomfort or hardship now? Yes, we may lose everything that the world gives us. But what good is it to gain the whole world if we lose our soul in the process? We see passion around us everywhere, for better or for worse. Do we have that same passion for Christ and his church and for the grace that he gave us on Easter morn? Easter was an event that changed history forever. Are we willing to give our all for him because he gave his all for us? As I close, I want to share a short video with you. So Harry, you may want to prep the sound. But before I do, I want to leave you with a short thought. We live in a world that has had an extreme makeover. A world that is very different from Easter Friday, or from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. All because of the events that took place on those days. Jesus' death and resurrection has changed everything. The question is, does it make a difference to us?